you've dialed in to Box and Brews, you might hear something you can use. Like tips on your cash or tips on the suds. You're going to want to use the smarts of these stuff. Because they know the brews. And they know the box. And they know they can't help the stubborn fucks. So listen up, because shit's not funny. And save yourself some beer money. Bucks and brews. Bucks and brews. And brews. Bucks and brews. Welcome back to Bucks and Brews. Nick, we have a jam-packed episode tonight. We do. Um, before, it, we've had an interesting day as well. Yeah. So before we get too far into it, what are you drinking, my friend? What, what, I'm, I'm gifted by the man to my left. Uh, OCP Oatmeal Cream Pie from Pigeon Hill, local in Muskegon, so not far from us. Um, David, thank you so much for the beer because I didn't get any. You're having a rough day. Um, I have a salty caramel porter, also from Pigeon Hill. Ooh. When I'm done with that, I have because it's summer. Yeah, a Seagram's Ice original. Nice. So I'll I'll join that afterwards. There we go. Um, we have a lot of people on today, so let's start with uh, the eye candy himself, Mr. Michael Benson. What are you drinking, my friend? Oh, well, let's see. Today I'm drinking it. I bought this, and I think I might have had it before, but it's Founders. It's their Green Zebra. It's a there goes a ale, and it's a variety pack, so I've got a few different flavors, and if I run out of that, I've still got some shorts, uh, soft parade that I might drink, but yeah. Right. Let's uh, let's go to a non-alcoholic portion of the show. Uh, Professor Seawick, my friend, how are you? I'm doing excellent. Thank you for asking. What do you have? Yeah. Well, a little bit of a curveball tonight. It is not City of Lansing tap water, nor is it coffee. Whoa. So... However, it is a it is a beverage that is made with hops, is carbonated, oh, is buddy. typically drank in cold, and is known for its mellowing effects. It is not alcoholic though. It is hop soda, hop tea. Oh, I discovered tea. this stuff like probably two years ago, and just fell in love with it. I enjoyed some hop tea myself. Yeah, so that's what I'm drinking. It's basically like a chamomile tea that's made with carbonated water and then hops. Nice. Is that just a, a uh, mason jar you're drinking it out of? Oh, yeah. yeah absolutely. Awesome. Right. Every man drinks from a mason jar. <laughs> so it, it kind of tastes like, I don't know if you've ever had, because I don't know that I ever bought it in the United States, but in Europe, I used to drink a beer called Cronenberg Blanc, and it was a Bel mm. think Belgian beer. Belgian, uh, yep. Yeah, it tastes like apples, very basically. Well. Very, very mm. good. So this that's the closest this kind of is for a non-alcoholic. All right. There you go. So we're also joined by uh, Mr. Jim Lowry, who is now going to be referred to forevermore as El Presidente. Thank you, Michael, for that new nickname for Jim. Oh, yeah, it's like a new Thank role that. that we might have to change his name. Well, as you can tell by the non-controversial and rather banal art behind us, um, I am in a hotel room in Texas, so I'm uh, enjoying some Dr. Pepper Diet non-IPA. There you go. Nick's not alcoholic drink tonight is also Dr. Dr. Pepper. Pepper. Zero. Oh, his, just has, his just has the sugar in it. I, no, his is zero sugar. Zero sugar. Oh, zero. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. He has the zero as opposed to the diet. I, uh, <laughs> huh. It's, it's going to be weird to drink one beer. It is. Um, we are joined tonight by Scott Bennett, who I found on TikTok. And uh, I absolutely love his TikTok. Um, right up my alley. Uh, it, the one I discovered was the uh, stock buyback one, which I have absolute thoughts on scott what are you drinking my friend cheers I'm, i've got a little liquid bread uh guinness from a can in uh one of my english uh pint mugs here that i really love nice. Good. i also have a a, a krombacher pilsner this is my favorite one uh that i pick up at the mm. local uh liquor store the german beer it's good stuff yeah let's see it's and my, where you my, are day, he's my new best friend <laughs> I, I figured you would say that. Um, you have to hit us with your normal new opening now. So everybody, thanks so much for joining us. As always, like, subscribe, share, tell your friends, tell your family. Uh, we've brought our family here for you guys to listen to and bring you great insight. So uh, with that, before we get into that, yeah, I want to I want to take a, a left turn. OK, um, so we had a weekend. You more than me. <laughs> i've had i've had a few days. i want to touch on this sure because we did this on the mental health episode sure so 
you saw somebody this weekend that told you to, and I quote, eat his ass with a spoon. That is correct. And uh, how did that go? Um, so not well. Uh, I so can it, imagine. It, 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 uh, he came to my property that I happened to own. Yeah. Something was going on. He, he right away avoided me, walked around, came by probably three minutes later, and I simply asked what he was doing on my property. Uh, that led to me being verbally assaulted in plenty of ways, escalated. So I then basically walk and start chasing towards him mm -hmm. and being asked not to. Uh, he leaves, comes back about three minutes later, uh, and I was like, this isn't going to go well. Anyway, throughout that time, uh, over the course of that night, I, my life got threatened three times. Um, and that, you know, didn't go well for me. So, uh, just, just a lot of fun for what people think. And I'm, it, it all started because he <clears throat> just strictly hates me because I'm a landlord. So I, I want to say this because I have a, a microphone and we have a little bit of an audience. Yeah. Um, if it had been me, yeah, he'd have been in a much more world of hurt because I'd have just called the fucking cops and as I was arrested. Oh. I just want to say that because of all the people that think you were a prick for you know not just being the bigger man and letting him walk all over you. Yeah, I mean, you know, and it's it's really hard once he starts threatening, you know, yeah. bodily harm and stuff like that. At that point, yeah, you had every right to basically yeah. be like, get this guy arrested at him. Yeah. And, and his job selling um, pot or growing pot or whatever uh, pot related thing he does. Yeah. And, and, you know, I say my, my, for me, for me, it's very hard because I know I'm a hothead. I know no. how I handle things, you know, and, you know, out of respect just for my wife and, and what, you know, because I, I step on eggshells around her family. She has no idea how much I hold back things. Right. Like for me to stop and not just follow this guy, you know, I hit my property line and just was like, all right, this isn't worth it. He's just going to keep walking away, even though he's like, let's go. And then, well, let's say, and then he called me, right? And then he just- Many times. Right? And people are like, oh, hey, you got you to gotta unfollow him. And I was like, are you going to, you know, block, block, block him? And I was like, no, he's stupid enough to tell me what he's going to go do. And I'm smart enough to know where I'm going to be and how I'm going to react, right? right? Like, that's the only reason I didn't do it. And in my head, so just, uh, you know, and, and her whole family's just, going crazy and you know so somehow i ended up the asshole out of this conversation so I, I, that's usually what we do is yeah. The asshole. So, yeah and and you know i i grew up very different than most people right so like when when something was said in my neighborhood right it was that was what's going to happen right <laughs> one one way or another so you know, uh most people don't understand that like there was multiple shootings in my neighborhood mm -hmm. there was things that happened in a constant so of course i'm always on high alert i'm all i take everything very serious right mm -hmm. i if i say something i mean it mm -hmm. for the most part right there's mm -hmm. a one percent chance that i don't but like that you know and so that to me everybody's like oh he won't do anything he won't do anything and i was like i don't care what you think are you are you willing to risk that one the problem chance? is when people say those type of things yeah it motivates the other people to oh you don't think i will yeah exactly, yeah. right because that's i'm the type of person that's like that they go oh he won't do anything yeah oh really yeah and uh yeah so it just it was it was not a great weekend in that sense. You know, my, my wife, she, she did wonderful, right? She had my back on it and things, but, um, eh, you know, couldn't tell you I had the greatest weekend of my life. <laughs> so, um, and then today, right. I go and fall in a pool and lose my phone. Lose your phone. Yeah, you know, for like that. a week. And how many times on this, on this thing, have I told everybody how much I hate that pool? You do hate and that now pool. I hate it even more. <laughs> oh, so a, an um, awful showdown that you had well, to be involved in. I'll propose a toast. Yeah. Here's to a great Memorial Day weekend, gentlemen. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you. I like that idea. Oh, hey, Jim, when do you come two. home? Uh, uh, Friday. So if you're not doing anything, hit me up. Okay. So Nick had a showdown over the weekend. There's a showdown going on in Washington right now. There um, is. Let's talk about the debt ceiling. Yeah, because it's it's there. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's kind of there. Yeah. We did talk about this a couple months ago. Uh, the professor joined us for that, but this is definitely a hot button issue because uh, so, we're going to default. Let me first, uh, I do not know as much to think about Scott uh, in your background. So uh, where are you uh, located right now? And if you don't mind me asking the rest of you either, um, Scott, what uh, what's your background? 
Uh, so I live in Chicago. I work in television. Um, my background is uh, as a writer producer, kind of work behind the scenes. Um, I've been working on a book for uh, about 10 years now, a little more than 10 years, um, writing it in my spare time. And when it looked like TikTok was uh, maybe going to be outlawed, I I had been planning to use TikTok um, to get my message out. I, uh, I had um, about a year ago done a, a TikTok channel for my dad for a little business enterprise he was trying to get off the ground. So I, I had a little background in it and I knew I wanted to use TikTok. I'm a big TikTok user. You know, I watch it every day. I love it. And uh, so when it, TikTok was in danger, I thought I got to get on here and, and start getting this message out. Uh, and uh, that's how you ended up seeing my Walmart material, which was actually written about five years ago, but basically all still applies. Uh, so that's my background, and that's where I am from. Excellent. Cool. And, and I the University of Chicago. So Scott used to come out cricket for me. That's when we're at Chicago. For, I think uh, that uh, absolutely maybe. has to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Or even when we're there for. I was Expo. thinking of somebody's bachelor party. I was thinking, well, I was, that's what I was thinking first, but maybe Fab Expo, too. Oh, that's well. a uh, University like a wild time. <laughs> so, so that's great. You graduated um, from the University of Michigan? That's right. I, I had a double major in English and communications, but that uh, no further studies after that. Well, that's okay. U, U of M is a, a pretty, uh, pretty good place. So, thank uh, you. Yeah. I like it. So, all right, anyway, back to the debt ceiling. And I mean, we are due in uh, six days. It depends. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Say, right? Yes. About that. But, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, it, for all intents and purposes, I mean, June 1st or 4th, whatever the date was, is D Day to make this happen. So um, the House can't figure out how to get their heads out of their butt. They can't make no. a proposal go into place they could get their heads out of their ass but they haven't. the problem is it's, we have too many idiots yeah and and it's a bad a really bad problem too because it's an invented problem <laughs> and Very invented much. problems are the really tough ones to solve because the people that invented the problem don't want to solve it exactly and uh Historic. that's kind of what you got going on here i mean this is this is the husband and wife fighting about the credit card bill while they're sitting on the couch they bought with it and watching the TV that they bought with it, saying we we shouldn't have to pay this. How dare you be so foolish with our money? I mean, yeah. that's kind of what's going on here. But there's a deeper uh, ideological component to it that I'm not, uh, <laughs> you know, absent-minded enough to to lose sight of. And obviously, there's people that think that they're going to score some major political point if we can bring it just right down to that absolute very end. And I think it was. 2008 or nine, somewhere around there is the last time it got this close. And they momentarily, the U S had a lowered uh, bond rating right. from this. And, uh, you know, the country's taken on a lot of debt over the last couple of years. So if that caused, even if that happened and that caused a, a longer term, uh, high interest rate period than right now, people are going to notice it in, in a way that they aren't thinking about the interest rates people think are high now and they are for most people's sort of mortgage holding lifetimes. But by historical standards, they're actually not nearly as high as they can get. I mean, Dave, you and I grew up in the same, pretty much even the same neighborhood, the same time period mm -hmm. in houses that cost in the mid twenties to thirties thousand dollar range in the mid 1970s. And by the 1990s, those things were, selling for a uh, hundred thousand dollars some of them so inflation was really bad back then my childhood home was twenty thousand dollars yeah it's and on so, five acres and it's fifty four hundred square feet sure yep and and the one i grew up in i think my mom and dad told me they paid like 22 or twenty three thousand for it in the mid 70s and i don't know what they sold it for in the mid 90s but it was a lot more than that obviously oh absolutely yep well, you know, I, I read a statistic the other day, and don't quote me, I could be wrong, that 25% of our, our debt right now can be traced back to the last presidency. He yeah, added 25% on to what we have. Yeah, I, I believe it, especially if you adjust the 
value of debt to inflation, which is like a snowball, actually, it just mm -hmm. gets worse the more debt you bring on because the more devalued the currency can it become. Oh, come on. And, I thought uh, giving tax breaks to the rich would solve all the problems. You would think that. It doesn't seem to work that way. Or a fiscally conservative or a party that claims to be fiscally conservative. Yeah. That, yeah, I think you mentioned 2008. I mean, that's a, that's a great place to start the discussion because that was when Barack Obama uh, decided to negotiate over the debt ceiling uh, with the Republicans at that point and kind of gave them this, uh, you know, idea that it's OK to, to hold the whole country hostage uh, when the Republicans are out of power to try and, you know, get whatever is on their wish list for the moment uh, and, and kind of put them in a, in a poll position. But for, for me, honestly, I don't get really worked up about this because everybody knows what, you know, a complete self-own it would be to actually, you know, not raise the debt limit and then blow up our currency, especially with the whole BRICS situation happening right now. You know, they're, they're threatening to come up with some sort of alternative currency and pop us off the old uh, petrodollar, uh, which would, you know, that's a whole other kettle of fish, but you know, these, all these things happening at the same time, it would really be suicidal to actually let this debt ceiling expire and, and go into default. It's just crazy. Well, you know, Scott, well, like you, yeah. you talk about in your, um, in TikTok, that I really enjoyed, thought you did a great job with about, Thank you, sir. Attacks, right. Um, for example, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's like burning money. And the reason that it's done is because people that are very, very wealthy get, much more wealthy, right? It's 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 intended to create, um, it's intended to keep moving wealth upward. And if the economy collapses, those folks are going to be very, very, very unhappy with our political class, right? And so I don't see, I I, I don't see the the folks that pull the strings of the folks that are pulling the strings allowing that to happen. A great point, and I would only add to that. You know, you brought up a great point about, um, well, just thinking about the debt in general. Why do we have so much debt? Because we're not taxing the rich. Instead exactly. of taxing for the rich, we're borrowing from the rich. So yeah. they they win both ways. You know, instead of being taxed, they just get to you know buy all these bonds, and we borrow from them, and then pay them interest on the money we're borrowing. So you know they win coming and going in that situation. Well, see, we're referencing the uh, TikTok you did on stock buybacks. So part of my capstone was I had to run a hypothetical company and you got you know points based on everything you did for this company and two of the things that really pissed me off um running this company was a way to get max points was to take out the maximum amount of debt every year so you had to take every available loan there was and the other one was you had to buy back all the stock that they allowed you to every year which also to me is an asshole move because not only are you taking on all of this extra debt that you may or may not need, but then you're using that debt to buy back all of the stock to make your company more valuable and screw over everybody else. And I, That's my, what I got a great grade in this class, but fundamentally it just drove me insane. Mm -hmm. That's the expectation of how corporate finance is going to work. And, and the, that is a model of get rich quick off stock. Mm -hmm. It's it's just this right here. Yep. A, a short term investor owns it enough that these accounting gimmicks, which is what that is, get the stock to be artificially inflated yep. long enough that they can sell it, make money, and then it's dumped, and then it goes down, and then people get in at the bottom, and then it, the cycle goes up and down again. And it used to be companies they would they kind of do the opposite. <laughs> Right? They would divide their stock when it got to be really high value because it was a way of raising money quickly. Mm -hmm. It's a very That's safe a way of high. doing it, really oh, safe way of getting cash on, on hand. And so they would do that. But now they do the opposite. They'll well, most of them. Right? Inflate I mean... the value of their stock, and then that becomes a part of the of the pay package for the upper executives. Yeah. You know, you look at... um. <clears throat> Oh my gosh, Warren Buffett, right? Mm -hmm. Never once has Brookshire Hathaway uh, ever split their stock, right? It's just gone the whole way. Mm -hmm. um, but, and then they just started a whole separate, like it, they have A and B, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like mm -hmm. though I've had a couple stocks where yeah, I'm in, I'm owning them and then all of a sudden they tank because they split and sure I own two of them. But 
you know, normally just goes lower real quick because they're like, hey, they're, they're not financially where they should be. My daughter bought Amazon. Exactly. And then they split. <laughs> Every share was worth 20 now. Yep. And then, you know, the hope is it goes and it, it, over time, right? History will make it happen. But you're that's a great way to start <laughs> getting more people to fund more money, right? And, uh, you know, I, I think most you know, most companies used to do that, right? I mean, now it's not happening. And uh, Scott, I think yours was specific about Walmart themselves. And uh, it's funny because David, David absolutely despises Walmart. I, fucking hate Walmart. I, I think their business plan of things is great. Um, it's it's really, it's a fun conversation. What what business plan exactly? The one where they pay employees less than the, what they're worth and they're all on public funds nope nope that was the uh, subject of another of my tic tacs it yeah. was <laughs> say um i you know well, I love if the fact you if just before we move on to i one more thing about yeah, the sure. whole stock buyback and and splitting stocks this gets, gets back to a fundamental difference in the way corporate management is the philosophy used to be that the company wasn't going to have ever so much cash on hand that they truly didn't ever need to borrow money. And the reason is, is because this country had a tax structure that made it disadva very disadvantageous for a corporation to do that because mm -hmm. their executives wouldn't make as much money as they actually could if they were paid a lower salary, but then had other perks of working there that because the taxes would get up to them in the end. So oh, yeah. Yeah. Then the corporate tax structure was completely changed. Reagan came in. They lowered the income tax rate. All uh, Some of the reforms that Scott talked about in his TikTok video are one of the many, many, many things that now corporations like Apple, they don't need to, to ever split their stock. They, they have so much cash. Mm -hmm. They spent a billion and a half dollars redoing Hewlett Packard's old corporate headquarters, sharing it to their own campus. And then they still have about a trillion dollars left to burn so they don't they're in the opposite situation if there was a tax structure that redistributed their wealth in a way that well at least was it used to be uh to borrow an argument from paul krugman um they those corporations would not have all that cash on hand yeah i agree i think you can go back to uh, Milton Friedman and uh, a lot of his ideas in the in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, all up into the 80s. He was a Reagan was a huge fan. Uh, and, you know, he was all about putting the shareholders at the center and uh, kind of redefining who owned a company as the shareholders. And so with this new shareholder value mindset, you get these ideas like, you know, the whole the whole system becomes very short-term focused uh, instead of long-term, like David was talking about. And once upon a time, uh, companies were able to plan out further than, you know, whatever's happening in the next quarterly reports. Uh, and now it's all now, now, now. And, and that ties in with the uh, CEO compensation, which was alluded to, you know, the whole system is, is built around this idea of, concentrating wealth even more at the top and you know one of the ways that you do that is you get the ceos uh into the shareholder value game by giving them as much stock as you can so that they too have a self-interest in focusing mostly on stock price yeah and not only that but but it's a short-term focus right as opposed to building out the value of the organization over the long term when that Absolutely. compensation becomes such a large part of their package then they're the only incentive is the next quarter or the next you know year yeah. or whatever as opposed yeah. to you know I, I work with a lot of organizations that do five and ten year plans and it's almost a joke particularly for publicly held companies um, mm -hmm. it's really almost a joke because you know that they're gonna there's gonna be siphoning money off and they're gonna be artificially you know managing their stock price and things like that and it's it, there's no point in planning beyond the next you know at, at most six to eight quarters right. You know, right. I, well, and it's built into the system, too, because if the shareholders aren't getting their value maximized, they're going to have a rebellion and the CEO's out yeah. and they'll put somebody else in who does do what they want. Exactly. Yep. You know, I, I worked like, at Gentex Corporation and we got quarterly bonuses mm -hmm. and the CEO used to be Fred Bauer. Um, and you everything's public when you're a public company. Yeah. right? So he made four hundred thousand dollars a year. OK. Now, the vice president uh, 
his earnings around it was eight hundred and sixty thousand dollars, right? It was, it was insane. But so he made more than what Fred did. But Fred had so much in stocks, and you do the math, and every quarter he'd make two point three million dollars. Um, and they, you know, forever. Yeah, I had great bonuses, right? Anywhere from nineteen to twenty three, twenty five. You know, and finally after I think we hit a year and a half, so uh, six bonuses. Um, they were like, you know what, we're going to lower the, but we're going to give you 5% more money, which was great. I had a bigger paycheck. So that way my bonuses were down in the, the 19 range. Right. And then it grow up, but all it does is give Fred more money. Right. <laughs> at the back end again, he's not taxed on it. He's not. And then, you know, near the end of my career there, um, you know, he, he stepped down or whatever they want to call it. And I mean, he's still getting all of this as his what thing, company right? is this this was gentex corporation okay. uh they they made inside and outside car mirrors for every what auto you're describe yeah part of what you're all describing is uh so at one time some corporations had a governance structure where the there was a chairman of the board and he was separate than the chief executive officer and f- for this reason because the chairman, the the board, their you know theory was that they had a different. Not all of their goals were the same as the manager of the company. Mm-hmm. It's sort of like the difference between the president of the college and the board of trustees, and they used to look at it that way. But when you've got most of the pay going into the chief executive of the corporation being in the shares, he becomes like the largest shareholder or mm-hmm. one of the largest shareholders. So. It's the opposite. He runs the board. The board yeah. doesn't run him. And, and, and they can basically pay themselves however much money they want. And that was it. He, he, you know, he was the founder. And, you know, we would always hear, hey, he started in his garage. And I always told everybody, I said, I don't care how much the guy makes. He started it. He made the company as big as it is. When I left, I think there was like 3,800 employees, right? And he did great. Like, when it comes to that. And we'll dive into it more, you know, later. But like... Did- for him, I don't care how much he makes. Now that he stepped away, oh, I'm really pissed that the guy's making a million bucks a year or whatever because he didn't earn that aspect of things. You want to know what I'm right. going to say? Go ahead. What the fuck's a bonus? It's a, yeah. it's, it's, I got a, <laughs> it's that jacket. I got a $20 baggie for Not 20 years. a lot years. of those these days. Yeah. yeah but it also I got money. You know. No, but also... I, you and I don't always agree on, like, the wealthy people. Oh yeah, but I agree a hundred percent with you there. If you started a company with your bare hands, if you're getting paid an exorbitant amount of money by the time you retire, you deserve it because you built that thing yourself. Yep, and and that's I never have had a problem, right? So we go back to the Walmart thing, just because I I do love to pick on Walmart as well. But like, so Sam Walton, I don't care how he made generational wealth. He did, but the fact that his kids. And his grandkids are still some of the wealthiest people on the list. They've done nothing. No, the Meyer no. family, right? They've done nothing. Actually, the Meyer family is pretty involved. There's only a couple that sit on the side. Um, but the, the Meyer, yeah, some... the Meyer, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick up for. Yeah. Hank and I would agree. Thank you a lot for the community. He's a a no spot on author too. Corporation. Well, yeah. If I could stick up spot for on. one other uh, segment that's not getting discussed in mm-hmm. in the <laughs> sure. Walton discussion or. Gen, your your company, Gen Tech, uh, Gen Tech. It's not my um, company. I don't work there anymore. <laughs> they fired, <laughs> he got fired. <laughs> Say they fired well, me. But here, you know, the workers who adds re- real value to a company. Who's who's workers. really you Thank know you. who's running Walmart? It's those two point three million people that mm-hmm. are employed by Walmart. Yep. It's not. Economics it's not. Walmart. Sam Walton yeah. wasn't doing it all himself. Now you know. Hats off to Sam Walton. He came up with some amazing innovations, but. He also came up with some very destructive innovations that are hurting yeah. this country. And some of those innovations were severely underpaying his workers and, and using tax abatements and, and getting all sorts of sweetheart tax deals uh, to make sure that they don't pay taxes when they come into a, a, a new town. And then, you know, you know some the of their competitive, Michigan. some of their um, competitive strategies to intentionally undersell all the local merchants and drive them out of business and then jack up prices. That was all Sam Walton. And uh, I, I'm not going to defend that kind of uh, business because, you know, it ends up being very destructive over time. Right and we're seeing, yeah. we're seeing the product of that today. So, no, what he did well was basically like, yeah, yeah, I'll sell all these other brands, but I'm also going to have my own brands. But and I'm going to have the company. I'm going to own that. You know, we're going to 
the companies that make those brands are going to be part of and like that's where they did it i mean he bought his own trucks he bought his own you know warehouses sure. on. He, one thing one other thing matter. he did was uh you know figure out how to keep track of every item of merchandise in the store you know they're bet walmart's better than everybody else at knowing exactly what's on the shelf and what's on oh, yeah. the truck and what's coming yep. out they they've got it all down to a science so and and that's why i love that like when yeah. I say, hey, I like it, it's because they do, do they do really horrible things, really shitty? Yes. But God, it's not an either look or. At the business itself, it's actually a very I, smart, I good business. Both. I think it can be both for any organization or corporation. And that can, a lot of, a lot of that has to do with who's yeah. running them. And, you know, the thing about Walmart, Target, Home Depot, I don't care who the big box retailer is. In Michigan, they have the granddaddy of all tax breaks by sort of by default because over the years the local property tax laws have been interpreted <laughs> or the state property tax law has been interpreted that their property is valued basically as if it was an empty building yep mm -hmm. well and that's, that's how it's valued they don't value the merchandise and they don't value the amount of value being added onto the property with the business being transacted there which scott you're talking about the workers everybody yes thank you for mentioning them that's why there's value added onto that property. Mm -hmm. All the stuff in that store at one time was your neighbor's job. But mm -hmm. because the corporation stabbed all of their workers in the back, you could say, and moved the jobs overseas, your neighbor doesn't make that stuff anymore. So there's no value added onto that good when it comes into the country until you take it off the ship, drive it to the store, put it on the shelf in the store and ring the person up. So their entire corporation's wealth is in the people that work for them. And they know that. That's why they've tried very, very hard to keep their wages as low as they can, because that's how they make their money, period. Yeah, and one other thing, you know, a lot of commenters on my TikToks are pointing out is the, you know, they're they're the number one employer in the country right now, but they're their long-term goal is to get that number way down and to automate and do all the self-checkout uh, and eliminate as many of those jobs as they can. Yep. I've heard a really interesting and, article about 10 years ago that said, you know, is, is Walmart going to destroy itself because they're essentially, um, you know, underpaying their workers and so forth, and they employ so many people that when, as those people, uh, you know, lose their jobs and so forth, there's, there's, there's not necessarily going to be a whole lot of people left to buy their products, right? I mean, there That's will right. be, obviously, but it's, it's a significant number, right? That could ultimately end up, uh, you know, particularly in some communities where their, um, where their uh, volume is marginal, that could, that could put them out, you know, uh, force them to close doors. Absolutely, Jim. I totally agree. That's a great point. I, I I also discussed this in a different TikTok talking about Henry Ford and his $5 workday. How Henry Ford, 100 years ago in Michigan, uh, was paying $5 a day. Now, hey, Henry Ford, kind of a jerk. You know, there's the Nazi stuff. Not a great guy or a icon that we should all be loving. But, you know, he did this one great thing, which was double his worker's salary so that they could potentially afford the Model Ts that they were making. So that's a great idea. Is And the more you pay workers, the more they can pump into the economy. What's yeah. happening now with all the Walmart workers being on uh, SNAP benefits is they spend those SNAP benefits at Walmart. And yep. you know, that's just a small microcosm Man. of the potential there. If you, know, if you yep. start paying Walmart workers a decent salary, then they can afford to buy a lot more at Walmart. Exactly. And you know, I, so I have a couple quick things on that. One, I want to go back to the property taxes. Mm -hmm. um, so Gentex, again, they have seven buildings on quite a bit of land. Who do you think pays more property tax? You, you or me. You. Yeah. You. Exactly. It's actually, that's a factual thing. It's not even close. So uh, I think last I seen like the new building, they were paying $700 in taxes mm -hmm. and it was going to be that way for 50 years. Yeah. yeah okay. and there's, on one of my buildings. Property. Publicly on, traded companies, and on so they have to disclose every bit of that information. But they've eleven thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. They've had all kinds of things have happened over the last twenty years in Michigan that have led to that. Yep. One of which is the state got rid of uh, about fifteen years ago, a while ago. They got rid of the personal property tax for business, and it mm -hmm. used to be the state had this thing where most of the tax a business paid was actually on the value of the machinery 
yep. and and the equipment in there. And the reason for that is the state was a manufacturing state. We never had a VAT. Now I'm not going to get into a complex macroeconomic you know tax discussion here, but a value added tax kind of does the same thing on the consumer end of it that the state's valuation of manufacturing originally property inside the building did. Well, the state got rid of that. They said they would replace the val the uh, revenue to local uh, local municipalities, and guess what? They didn't, of course. And so that revenue wasn't made up for. Nick, what you're seeing is the end result of that. I, From a business owner's perspective, hey, actually, I would have said, yeah, great, they got rid of it. But the other end of the bargain was what wasn't lived up to, and that is yes. the state. Not make up for that lost revenue. Well, Dave, David, you're so right. And, you know, every one of us uh, is paying more property taxes than ever. And it's no mystery why. It's because all of that corporate taxation just keep going lower and lower and lower. And we're the ones who pick up the slack. We're the ones, you know, uh, 330 million people all kicking into the kitty in place of these corporations. They're making all this money. And we're the ones who are asked to pay more in our property taxes. Because they're the ones getting the sweetheart deals. Yep, and um, you know, and and you see that through everything. You know, one thing I'm I like to see how they're going to change things because you'd kind of brought up uh, the fact that uh, they bought the uh, the Mac co- or HP Corporation and revamped yeah, yeah. into that. Yep. But right Definitely now that. we're heading into a thing. COVID kind of hit where everybody's kind of working from home. We're not going to see as many office buildings. We're not going to see as much of this. Are we happening. not though? Because how many CEOs are sitting there going, nope, we got to bring everybody back into the office because I, I have to I, sit there and stare at you to make sure you're doing your fucking job. It's a job. generational thing. I think as long as you've got boomers running the corporations, yep. which you will for the next, you know, 10 years. I, yeah, because trust well, me, I mean, I see this. Well, I, David, do you really I think, think that's I can true? Even but let's not forget. There's a lot of Gen Xers but, who don't have the trust. So with, let's, there's a yeah. key financial oh. consideration that we're forgetting here, yep. which is the fact that these giant properties, uh, they do pay a lot of money for for mortgages or what have you. And oh, yeah. if, if oh, yeah. those buildings are empty and there's no yeah. justification for having them, Absolutely. then they are all going to go on the market at fire sale prices and all oh. those companies are going to lose big bucks. You know, yeah. here in downtown Chicago during the pandemic, uh, the the uh what do you call it? The rates of, of uh, vacancy Occupancy. were, were yeah. through the roof. You know, the, yep. people were abandoning these these properties and these giant skyscrapers are like 30, 40 percent empty. You, you can't have that. So that's the reason why we have to come back to work oh, yeah. because those the value of those properties depends on us showing up at those buildings. Or you, you have, have to convert them to like this, year's, buy back this year's power at a fire sale. It, it happened here in Lansing on a small scale. But then the other thing, too, is the municipalities have a lot of them are speaking of property taxes they're very dependent upon those property taxes and if those buildings sit empty they get a big time devaluation Mm -hmm. and then the company can write them off um so it's a big loss for the it's a big loss for the company um at one time they uh they absorbed the loss but then after that the I think at the municipality level, municipality level, sorry. Yep. Oh, yeah. I mean, they really it's... like it. Probably the why they don't care as much about like really upping the taxes on it for them. It's more important from an advertisement perspective to have these large companies have facilities there. Like when I thought of like when Target added their distribution center and like what the Climax Scotts area, like it was oh, never yeah. about it. Was, it was basically yeah. be like, we're going to have, you know, 5,000 new jobs and, you know, this building, and it wasn't about, like, but, you know, when we talk about the value of, like, you know, the actual companies, like, there's probably no Walmart store that when you look at all the people in it, all the merchandise, it's not several million dollars worth of money in well, that particular store. Yeah, and so Nick, part of what... In manufacturing, that's millions of dollars of investment. Yes. And that is what... Manufacturing facility... Mike, what you've brought into the discussion here is the one thing we still haven't that is super important. This is, in the end, why they don't make much money at Walmart, and they never, ever, ever will. Mm-hmm. Trust me. The corporation will go out of business before they ever pay the workers much money. Here's yeah. why. Because the General Motors plant, when you go into that plant, 
what you are seeing is a ton of value added onto materials at multiple stages of the economy that never can happen in a retail store because it's selling stuff where all that value is already added onto the good. The GM and everything's factory, recycling. Nothing is there yeah, permanently. The GM except like factory the is literally back. worth a multiplier factor of probably at least five to the economy of what that Walmart store ever could be. Mm -hmm. And oh, yeah. you can never replace that unless you completely reorient your economy. And, and it hasn't happened, right? Here in Michigan, our economy is still structured that way. So I, it's, it's just the way it works. And it's macroeconomics, but it impacts people at the very local level. And so when, I think, Jim, you talked about when those Walmart stores close, how devastating that would be to the community. Think about it. That a community has now gone through like phase two of a really bad two phase economic devastation. Phase one was what got them to the point where Walmart was the only place left in town where you get a job, yep. right? Yep. And because they cut that, or buy your goods, even if there were other jobs yeah. available. So before that, it was probably a community that was mostly agricultural or had some small industry. Yep. Yep. So phase one, that's gone. Now the standard of living's dropped. So what standard of living is there going to be left when phase two comes? Yep. Well, I, I would say that one of the long-term projects of the wealthy over the last century has been to drag us back uh, to where we were as workers a hundred years ago, making mm -hmm. pennies a day. Um, you know, that's really, that's the idea. That's, that's what they would like. They, they love that third world style uh, mm -hmm. capitalism. Yep. Well, you know, it's, it's really interesting, too, because, you know, to bring to kind of approaches from a political economy standpoint, we're now talking about people, you know, voting against their own interest, right? Because mm -hmm. it's these Rust Belt towns, it's the, which are now going through, you know, there's the whole Rust Belt that, you know, with all the manufacturing left. And now we're talking about what you're saying, um, David, with the phase two, with these, um, you know, the, wall, the wall modification, if you will, of these towns. And these people are now voting for the people who put policies in place that cause these things to happen. Mm -hmm. And they don't realize that because now it's all about a culture war, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. The industry, that's the reason the culture yeah. war exists. Yep, exactly. Yep. The culture in the, war in the nothing but industry I work in, I mean, it could almost be, if I was more well known, it would probably already be a uh, term in like the dictionary, but I always called it Pfizerized. Because mm -hmm. basically, <laughs> these very small companies that had a lot of really bright scientists would come up with you know, possible pharmaceuticals and Pfizer would basically buy them, yep. take the rights of them, maybe keep the people around for a year and then basically mm -hmm. cut that group out just to have it. And I bet that it was, yeah, people lost their, it may have gotten a pretty good severance in the long run, but they're still losing, you know, people, it, unemployment is increasing by, you know, these. Yeah, and don't yeah. forget that having a large segment of unemployed people is a great thing. If you own a, own a corporation, you know, oh, yeah. you don't, you want to have a huge labor surplus because the more people are out there fighting for jobs, the easier it is to pay them absolute crap. Yep. Which yep. is why we'll right now, them. right now is the time. If there's ever going to be, uh, uh, you know, something left of the labor movement in this country, now is the time because you have a unique opportunity. The demographics in this country yeah, are in an odd spot. It isn't, isn't going to be this way in 20 years, and it wasn't this way 20 years ago. But right now, there is going to be continuously low unemployment mm -hmm. because of the gap between the size of the baby boom generation with the Gen Xers who are smaller in between, and we're the ones that are in the workforce now primarily, and it's going to be even more so. But that's kind of a sweet spot. So if workers right now, the unions better have really good leadership that knows what's over the horizon because now's the time to act. 20 years from now, there's not going to be 3% unemployment. There isn't That's a, a, a great there point, won't. David. I, I agree 100%. It makes me think of two different books that I've read. One of them is Crane Brinton's On Revolution. And in that book, he oh. looked at five different revolutions, the Russian Revolution, American Revolution, um, England, France, and um, one other, I think. But anyway, one of the, he developed a little theory about certain um, markers that show up when revolutions are becoming ripe, according to these historical 
events. And one of them is the most important one, I think, which David was talking about or hinting at, is when um, people expect to get one thing, but don't get it. So we, you know, all the all the gentlemen here were talking. Uh, our parents had a, probably had a, you know, I, I don't know if it, about a higher standard of living necessarily, but you know, there were cabins, there were boats, there were new cars every couple yeah. of years, one yeah. one breadwinner, and now that is completely gone. You know, everybody who's coming up now is a you know, two earner household. Maybe even the kids are kicking in. It's it's getting harder and harder just to make ends meet. Mm. And the other book that I was thinking of was called um, The Fall of the House of Labor. And that talks about how in the 1920s, uh, labor was flat on its back, kind of mm. like today, just like about as beaten down as you could possibly get. But then the depression happened and suddenly labor came roaring back. And, you know, that's kind of the point, I think, that we need to start thinking about because Right now, labor is on its back. The share of uh, unionized private, uh, you know, workforce that works for private companies uh, instead of as opposed to public, uh, public, uh, yeah. you know, government public agencies sector. and what have you, uh, yeah. is lower than it's been probably since the twenties. Uh, so slow. now there is huge, yeah. huge growth opportunity for unions to come back and for workers to join together. Because that's really, it's self-empowerment. Self-empowerment is the only way we're going to get out of this. It, because it if is. we let it, ruling class take us, it's going to go. It's going to go straight to the third world. We're going to be, you know, it's child labor laws are coming back. They're talking about that already in some oh, yeah. states. About, you know, but, and, loosening child labor restrictions. That, that's the direction we're going. Yeah, let me add one more comparison, though, to the 30s. And, and this is something a lot of people completely forget about. In the mid-1920s, right in the middle of the uh, economic growth that started in 1921, after the pandemic was finally over, <laughs> the last of the three kick them all out of this country, immigration laws passed, the Johnson-Reed Act, and the end result of that law was not felt until the World War II hits. One of the reasons why there was such a bad labor shortage during World War II was they ruined a generation of American workers. They were gone because they didn't let their parents come to this country. And that is one of the things that gave workers such a huge bargaining power because the unemployment rate was really bad in the early 1930s. It actually started to go down big time in 1936. Part of the reason why the Flint sit-down strike happened in 1937 was because the workers actually had work and they had power but then roosevelt tried balancing the budget the unemployment rate spiked up again but even then the demographics were starting to catch up finally but then world war ii hit and of course the unemployment rate plummeted but it would have gone down even if world war ii hadn't hit partially because of demographics so my point is i am usually not too overly optimistic about politics because you know, it's easy to be cynical, but I think workers right now truly have some things going for them. The even mediocre leadership could probably get some big gains for workers they haven't had in a long time. I think the biggest thing that workers have going for them is self-righteous rage. You know, <laughs> seeing, you know, these reminders that I, you know, like my own TikToks talking about just how rich the rich really are. I, we have a hard time understanding the difference between a billion and a million it just yeah. it doesn't even like it sounds similar and it's hard to conceptualize but it's like a million seconds you can do that in 11 days is a million seconds and it's 32 years i think is a billion seconds that's the difference it's just a completely exponentially different and um that's what the the wealthy class in this country they're they're dealing with that kind of money and all of us the rest of us regular Joes, we're just barely making ends meet. And it makes us mad, it makes us so mad when we know the truth about how much opulence and wealth um, is existing off of our own backs. All that wealth that's not trickling down, right? <clears throat> well, it's a lie. Trickle down but is I mean, a lie. And it, 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 it is hard to sit there and like I said, for a common person who doesn't have like a general understanding of numbers, like 
I mean, you look at even like it's the same the difference between a million and a billion is basically the same. It's the same mathematical difference okay. as one to a thousand or a thousand to a, million. a decent yeah. amount of things with a thousand dollars where you yeah. can't really do anything. But when you get up to those levels, like even when you look at like what you can do with a billion dollars or when you're looking at our debt being in the trillions, the it that's your like like wealth for like the rest of basically probably human existence when you look at the difference between a billion and a trillion dollars. Well, well sure. Like, I what, the, like the US GDP kind of... is something like seven trillion. So yep. did that get you an idea? Yes. It's a lot higher than that. Actually, well, no, no, I'm just saying that, that mathematical like 18 difference, you just don't trillion. realize a million and a billion is a big difference. I'm like, there's like, yeah, if you if you retire with a million dollars, you know, if you're not investing it well, eventually you're going to run out of it. If you retire with a billion, you're sad. You could just yeah. buy a new like car every day and you're still well, going to yeah, retire it, with and to your point it, you know it would be different it would be difficult to spend a billion dollars yeah. in a lifetime yeah. well and one of the things we're talking about here is perception i want to get back to walmart for a second so walmart comes into a community like south haven which you love yeah uh, i love was, south haven yeah, great community yeah. this was probably back Blueberry in the late festival 80s. Yep. yes and uh late 80s they got a walmart there's really nothing else to complete with, compete with Walmart in South Haven except for small businesses because they don't. I mean, they're a touristy town. They don't really have a whole lot there. So Walmart. Well, the nice part, at least, with that is Walmart. Like, if you're sitting down there in like one of the beachside areas, you're not going to just take a trip to Walmart to get correct a case of beer or a loaf of bread. I mean, you're going to go to one of the local stores. If you don't want to leave. Well, yeah, and if they're still open, but I, I mean, the point there is, you know, that was a big deal when they came, mm -hmm. you know, you look at an area like Chicago, on the other hand, they have, you know, a bunch of Walmarts, and many of them are closing, mm -hmm. because the perception that Walmart is painting is they're closing because of all of this theft. We have to close Walmart in, you know, on the south side of Chicago, because there's just so much theft, and it's rampant, and Leg it's costing us all of this money. <laughs> That's that's the reason why I started doing no. my Walmart series. No, 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 no. no. I was standing up for this, Scott. Please, <laughs> that's uh, not how it works. So I live in Chicago, and actually, there aren't a bunch of Walmart stores in the city of Chicago. There are only eight, and four of only. them are closing. So, um, you know, Walmart corporate is more than happy to sell this narrative that it's because of rioting and looting and theft that they just can't keep their doors open anymore and that's i've, I've known it at people all. who've been in management lie. levels at walmart and they already know they're this, expecting a this, certain percentage of loss due to that so walmart that's has perfect. actually been on um, usually it works the opposite and it's funny the news doesn't i haven't seen this report in the news right before covid there was i was following on my way to work in the morning i listened to some radio program and they had their ongoing retail apocalypse. And it was a sort of tongue-in-cheek story about how bad retail is doing bricks and mortar retail. But a side story was all of these communities in the suburbs and in small towns that had had it with Walmart and were asking them to leave and forcing uh, stores to close down, declaring them public nuisances. Why? Because Walmart had such a bad problem with theft because they got rid of their security that's mm. private property it is a wealthy corporation it is not the job of the taxpayer to be in there every five minutes with their police officers to guard mm. your property yeah, and if you can't take care of your property that is your problem yeah. and so people think it's oh it's the ghetto it's the hood and that proves that they can't have a company like walmart there when actually usually it's the opposite Walmart can't behave itself in any community sometimes, and therefore it has to leave. Yeah, you're right on, David. And I would only add that, um, you know, oh, shoot, I, was, I had a really great point. Uh, nope, I lost it. <laughs> Hopefully it comes back. <laughs> well, I'm like, not the, picking on them. With, with Walmart, they've been I remember... in the news, but my point is companies that think, or whenever the news is set up that it's like, you know, we tried this special thing. We were going to bring you poor hood people 
our beautiful corporation with, you know, you get to go in here and buy a banana in a Walmart store or a bag of lettuce or a bottle of Pepsi or whatever the heck you want to buy. Good for you. And it's then becomes the opposite that, yeah, well, there it is. America's cities aren't back yet. People can't behave themselves. The company had to leave. Yeah. I, okay. I remember now. And, you know, I, I agree with you 100%. And I would just add that uh, Walmart uh, loves this perception that it's theft. And that helps them cover up for the fact that um, they can't really compete uh, in a city like Chicago. Part of their whole um, plan for competing is wiping out the competition. In a city like Chicago, you can't wipe out hundreds of other stores that are within a three mile radius, right? So that you know that's a key part of how Walmart yeah. operates, especially in small towns, especially in small town Michigan, small town Oklahoma. They roll in, they wipe out the local sporting goods store, the hardware store, the grocery store. They, suddenly they're selling everything, right? Yep. You can't do that in Chicago. And it's it's all related to population density, right? It's just so you, you can't, you literally can't have enough stores to be successful doing that. Yep. Now, g gentlemen, I do need to bow out now. I appreciate, uh, Scott, it was very nice to meet you. I appreciate Jim, the, thank you so Jim. much. Thanks, Go Jim. Blue. Good seeing you. Go Blue. Thanks, thank you, Jim. Hope to see you again soon, Jim. Yeah. Thanks. Can't do this go blue thing. Well, you didn't go to either. Uh, go blue, go blue. I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I meet I meet Michigan graduates like everywhere in the world. Trust me. I know. I'm yeah. sorry. I uh I I mean I kind of a long story, but I was standing on the street corner in a not a big place, a smaller city in England once, and was just you know talking to a stranger waiting for the light to turn, and as it turned out, the guy was a <laughs> University of Michigan graduate. <laughs> Yeah, it was a little I more. Mean, they ever, I mean, but, yeah, all of those know. top tier schools, they end up everywhere. Like people just want to hire them wherever but, they can. But, I mean, you get a... I'll say the same thing though. I am a Central Michigan University graduate amongst I love uh, CMU. Amongst other place. And I have been on the streets in many city in the USA and around the world. I was walking in the uh, streets right in George Square in Glasgow, Scotland once. And I had a CMU uh football jersey on and i had my earphones in and but i saw somebody pointing at me so i took my earphones off and she came right up to me and she said in a in a lovely american accent fire up chips and i said <laughs> and i said back fire up chips and, and I, I remember like, going i was wherever you know, like walmart and they're willing to deal with like theft it was probably like 15 years ago i was in a walmart with like a friend i can't remember what we had bought but it was probably only like a few like small things but something with like how their computer was set up we triggered an alarm because their computer wasn't set up to like recognize like five dollar you know this out of the other thing is being sold and i'm like you know if you were like if they knew like this and it was like the security person they just said you have this in your bag and we showed them like I could literally. This was before they were like locking up like hundred dollar oh, yeah. like MP3 players and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Like literally, I could have like an MP3 player at the bottom of my bag and just have this like five dollar item. And literally just walk through and say, "Yep, I've got this." That's what's triggering it. I they would you know, they wouldn't be the wiser. It's companies sometimes the own worst enemies. I mean. Yeah. They are sometimes just to be like play sociology in my mind. You know, when I'm out working in my garden, I've got my bib overalls on and I'm, you know, good and dirty. I got to run into the store. Are you, are you sure like that's that. underneath your bib overalls? I'll just run in right like that. You know, got my hat on and I grab a shopping basket. And before I know it, I've got more people around me than, you know, you can shake a stick at, especially if it's, you know, I pull up in my, uh, my brother and I, that I, I share a pickup truck with. It's an old, kind of an old beater. And it's great. People take so much of an assumption by the appearance. But to get back to Walmart in Chicago, you know, the, the whole retail thing, the, I mean, it. I, I kept following these stories about these little towns and suburban mm -hmm. and semi-rural areas that, uh, because the company was too cheap to afford security. I mean, come on. Your TikTok video, Scott, you talk about how much, uh, just by ending the stock buyback practice they could have to pay their workers. Well, eh, more than yeah. $5 an hour. Yeah. How about one security person? 
I mean, yeah, right. They can afford it. Yeah, I think so. Even that, when you're in those small towns, if there's you know a ten minute drive between your town and the next small town, I'm like sure you can get a Walmart, but if there's a reasonable amount of jobs available, who's going to drive 20, 30 minutes for a minimum wage job? Well, and even then, I mean, the I think that the this gets us back to the whole we talk about the value added of you know an economy that does something besides handle goods that were made elsewhere. But then I think that there's a deep psychological trauma that society as a whole goes through eventually. If you have generation after generation where there isn't economic opportunity, um there has an economy such as ours doesn't work very well if there isn't that middle level of economic opportunity. Yeah. Everybody is never going to be rich and you do not want to have everybody poor either. Mm -hmm. And no. you have to have a society that has economic opportunity that doesn't require uh, an, a level of, say, effort or expertise that just isn't and never will be available to masses of people. No, the difference between like our countries and like true third world countries is the fact that you've got your extremely poor people and then you've got your like government leaders who are like super rich class have that generational wealth and mm -hmm. everything like that. But I mean, I think, you know, I remember when Walmart started coming into these areas in Michigan and especially when they started converting them to the superstore where you mm -hmm. could buy all of your groceries and everybody's like, you know, Meyer's going to be out of business because, you know, well, Myers never gone out of business. In fact, I've seen more like Myers build and because in general, people know that you're going to get a slightly better quality of store product other than your brand names at Meyer. Mm -hmm. And B, you're going to get a lot more personal attention. Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> another reason why the Chicago stores can't survive is because Chicago shoppers have alternatives and Chicago yeah. shoppers even in the hood, are politically yeah. aware. And they know that shopping at Walmart is, you know, not yeah. cool for workers. And if they have an alternative, they might find it. Well, and especially in those areas. Walmart. I mean, at that point, you've got you've got a very mixed, di you know, a very strong dynamic of races and stuff. And I mean, if you've got, you know, like, blacks, they might go to, like, a store that, focuses on a lot of like a black owned store and a lot of your Asians are going to go to you know stores where they can get all of their like seasonings and foods that remind them of home and everything and I said I think the, sure. uh, unfortunately how many things there are but there's well, Walgreens and Starbucks are what I see like every like fifth block in chicago well, well mine is open unfortunately in, in chicago there are food deserts which uh yeah. which are oh, neighborhoods yeah. where there are yeah. no grocery stores except yeah. for little bodegas where they charge yeah. you know charge a million dollars for a banana yeah. and uh you know the, the people who live there you know they they have a hard time getting to a, a decent store so that's why there were protests when the walmarts were closing because they came in they're the white knights on a horse so you know oh well we're finally going to bring a grocery store to your neighborhood and then they're like ah oh, second thought we're out you know i i would be mad about that too if yeah. i had to well, you know ride a train well, a half an hour away somewhere yeah. else to show. now compared to what myers did in detroit so detroit had i think it hadn't had a Myers in a long time. And Myers is, you know, the Michigan thing could start in Grand Rapids. And Myers actually on a smaller scale has done this in the smaller cities in Michigan too. They did it in Grand Rapids first. Lansing has one too. They've got another store that's kind of like a uh, Myers Square Dave. Well no it's yeah. so well, Mike Benson. I remember Myers Us Square. Yeah, Myers I was there for half a minute. At Michigan back in the eighties when those were still open. But anyways, Myers opened some of their big, huge stores in Detroit, in the city of Detroit. And they uh, were the first big box retailer that had gone into the city in a long time. And we're talking like, I think, 30 years, or if not longer. Walmart, I believe, still does not have any store that operates in the city of Detroit. The thing about Walmart is in Michigan, because of Myers, they never had, they, I think their expansion was really good until Myers started building stores in smaller towns. Mm -hmm. Then, that kind of put an end to, to Walmart's 
dominance. It really does. I mean, it feels so, like Meyer truly is. I mean, it's really only local to the greater Grand Rapids area, but still, when you look at it, Myers is a Michigan based company. Well, they're in five or seven states. Well, no, no, they no, are, no, no. I'm still yeah, Michigan. I'm based. talking about the like, history of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, people will sit there and be Rapids. like, Oh yeah, yeah the first was. Meyer stores ever open were in Michigan. Who cares about the fact that the first Walmart stores were in Arkansas? Yeah. yeah. So the three of us all grew up in the same town. If I, I know where our grocery shopping was done, the majority of our grocery shopping was done at Meyer. What Meyer did your open. parents go to, David? The one on Gold Road. Yeah. Okay, Mike. I mean, we if we were doing like I were to remember as a kid, it was usually about every two weeks, my mom and she would take one of the kids and it was kind of like we were like the special one the week we got the week we got to go to Meyer on the Friday night because we would be able to stop at the Purple Cow and get ice cream. And which one did you Purple go to? Cow. Which one? Gold Road. So yeah, we, would we went to Westnage. Those were your two options. Westnage or Gold Road. That was it. Yeah. Because they didn't open the West Main we one. Until like... I mean, we supported yeah. local because we had yeah. to because Same. we Even couldn't my make that dad. trip. Even my mom and dad, of course, you know, their kids worked at the store, so they had a good reason yeah. to. But yeah. even they, even before we worked there, every now and then, and they didn't have, you know, money to spare, trust me. Every now and then, even then, they would go to those local businesses mm-hmm. and spend a, you know, good chunk of the paycheck there. So those were very important to those communities. And yeah, sometimes you had to, like, you know, you guys being in kind of the Cooper area, you had that. Yep. Yeah, because it's that, really like close IPA to... right there at the corner, or yeah, and, you when know, your mom was getting out of work at St. Martin's, or, hit the Hardings, and yep, or it's Sigo eight o'clock or... at night, and you need a gallon of milk, and you're not, and it's snowing like the Dickens out, so you're not going to drive. Or even worse, time. you go to the gas station and you buy it, where it's even yeah. more hiked up than at the. No. I I think that Scott, you might have mentioned this, and I know. Um, our uh, departed guest had as well, El Presidente, about this idea about the uh, Walmart, but we could say any company uh, eventually becoming a victim of its own success, partially yeah. in its effort to automate, automate, automate. The I wonder if, you know, thinking out loud, back to my comment from earlier about this sweet spot we have a shortage of labor, I, I do think that, but eventually it may end up accelerating the the whole move to getting robots to do our jobs for us. I had a great discussion with a historian colleague of mine here last year. Maybe it was two years ago about this, but the crux of it was people at one time <laughs> would not only consider if it's possible, but they would also consider if we should do it. And our society is now as gun ho as it's ever been about that first contemplation if it's possible but we don't always think about well yeah but why would we actually do it and building robots to you know replace all of us might be one of those things and the last thing i'll say about that is i was listening to this british radio station i don't know this is before COVID, so a while ago and uh that comment that the show was all about this uh futurist back in the 60s that talked about how oh yes the future will be great because machines will do all the jobs that we hate and uh you know the only work left to do will be the good leisure stuff that we all enjoy and everybody will get along this guy on this program i was listening to was his sinister take on that was nobody ever f- commented on what would happen if all of that was true except only the people that owned the robots got to benefit from their labor. Exactly. That's exactly right. Um, you know, you talk about self-checkout, but also AI. I mean, there's this huge discussion right now. AI is coming for all our jobs. And I think there's a there's a sense of fatalism among the people and a sense of uh, a fate accompli almost that like, oh, this is almost already done and we're all going to lose our jobs. Um, but I think ultimately that is a political decision. And if yeah. the people were empowered, uh, we would we would definitely uh, not agree with that to uh, forego all of our jobs uh, to make wealthy people people even wealthier. And that's it's it's top down. You talk about AI, you talk about automation. This is all coming from the top down, from the executive suite, from the C suite. These guys 
are the ones who want to cut labor costs to the bone and ignore the fact that what you pay labor is all of your revenue. So, you know, you, you, you know, go ahead and starve labor all you want, but you're the ones who are going to put yourselves out of business. Yeah. And ultimately it is a political decision and we have, we should have a voice in determining whether or not computers or automation or self-checkout take all of our jobs from us. It should be up to us. And this is supposed to be a democratic yeah. nation and we should have a say in that. I think uh, yeah, it's never been officially a true democracy. I mean, even in our government's thing, we call it a democratic republic. We vote for the people we want to re represent us. But it's still, but we could vote in whomever, but if whomever's secret agenda is to replace well, it's Every not even secret, you know. Robot. Let's look. Let's look at who funds all of the campaigns. Now, this isn't going to be a conspiracy, which will be the really kind of sad thing about no, not it. Not at all. No. And you don't, you know, if history teaches us anything, it teaches us that the most effective way to make a change is never, ever through conspiracy. It's always. I mean, still, I mean you're still probably a thousand years before. Yeah, but I think what's, machines what's, become what's, sentient, like in you know. Well, I or anything like that. Yeah, that's a discussion for another day. I mean, yeah. science. Look, I can tell you right now, and I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you because I think it's it needs to be said. These don't be afraid of AI. That first GPT chat that supposedly all the smarty pants the New York Times couldn't get. Let me tell you, the first time I read that, I knew immediately which one the computer wrote because it the error quote unquote that it made was one that a little child would never make, actually, who's we, learning you know, that right. I, but I think... my point is that AI nowadays isn't anything intelligent. It still is 100% what a human being mm -hmm. programmed that thing to do. Yeah. But if it gets to the point where it actually is able to learn, it still probably isn't actually going to be a conscious machine. No. It's worse to have something that's smart but not conscious. That yeah. actually might be the really big thing to worry about. <laughs> well, that would be the entire thing. I mean, we're not going to be in jeopardy of jobs unless, like I said, you get like a HAL or a Skynet or something yeah. like that. Or, yeah. But and I mean, like I said, you've know, got four of us on this podcast that we know are baseball fans. Yeah. And I mean, every once in a while, I know they talk about, you know, robot umpires. The idea being, I don't think it's ever <laughs> going to happen because it takes kind of away the fun of the game to get rid of yeah. the human nature to umpire. It does. And this is always the ultimate fail safe to the, you know, robot. Oh, yeah. You get pissed off at the robot. Yeah. That's right, man. And this thing, yeah, this, this what are they going to do? What are they going to do? I could, I could oh, see Billy God. Barton going against a robot. Yep. That's right. You know when when kick, we're looking kick at a little kick a little dirt out of it, he's going to malfunction. When, when yep. we're looking at workers, you know, I I think Florida is going to be an interesting, um, we're going to say testing ground for some oh, of yeah. this because with DeSantis getting rid of you know migrant workers and we're going to throw all these yeah. supposed illegal people in jail even though nobody's illegal. Um, what he's probably conscious of but doesn't care about is the fact that. You're not replacing these people with anybody that wants to do these jobs. Nobody wants to go out and pick oranges. Um, nobody wants to go and, you know, do the grunt work on the construction sites. You get migrant workers to do that because they're willing to do that. That's a better life than they would have, you know, back from wherever they're from. And, you know, lazy assholes like Nick and I are going to look at that and go, yeah, I'm not doing that for 10 bucks an hour. Well, I would disagree just a little bit. Uh, okay. You know, the migrants are willing to do that labor for the lowest possible cost. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you paid yeah. a decent price, uh, you get plenty of people out there to, to pick oranges or work on construction sites as long as they can live off what you're paying them. And migrants right. uh, can only live off what the, you're paying them because a lot of them head back home. Uh, mm -hmm. or, or, you know, are sending as much money as they can back home because you would, the cost yeah. of living in those other countries is so much lower. Yep. I, this country would do a, a great benefit to itself if it simply went back through and 
revisited some of the agricultural labor laws that haven't been updated in absolutely forever. And, you know, agricultural labor is exempt from most of the, the safety and wage regulations that non-agricultural labor isn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that what Ron DeSantis is going to figure out, I is, I, I think, a lot of things. Yes, what you said, David, that these workers just aren't going to magically appear out of nowhere. That if you do not have them, that stuff isn't going to get picked. Or, 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 or that people who can't afford, like him, to actually pay labor what it's worth might have to do it. I don't know. Ron DeSantis is going to also figure out that you know, he's got a lot of, of future <laughs> uh, bad things coming his way if he, if he, if he succeeds yeah. in driving out right. a state chief employer. I mean, imagine if the state of Michigan just, you know, went to war with General Motors and said, you yeah. know, we hate your company. We hate its philosophy. We want you to get rid of all your factories in our state. We don't want your executives to live here anymore. We don't want your kids to go to our schools. Just get out of here. Because that's kind of what Ron DeSantis is doing to Disney, yep. to Universal, to every other thing that makes up like the bulk of his state's economy. Here's the is, is it? Really that he's, I mean, because I look back at, unfortunately, the kind of the, the great, the, the great of black years of 2016 to 20, mm -hmm. when really Trump was all about what could he do to get a reaction. It is, and I think Sanders is realizing if he's going to dethrone Trump, he's basically got to out Trump, Trump, Trump. Trump. Yeah. And I think, in the, to an extent, I think that's what he's trying to do at this point. It's positioning him in a way of, I, I can even, I'll take, a, I won't just take on immigrants and whomever, I'll take on Disney. I mean, I think I'll there's some there, truth to that. Dave, Dave, he may, Dave may never remember me it's bringing this one up, because I think we were a little drunk at the time, but I don't often go to pop culture for, like, good quotes, but Icky Thump by the White Stripes has a really good Set of lies and it's white Americans want nothing better to do. Why don't you kick yourself out? You're an immigrant too. Who's using who? What should we do? Well, you can't be a pimp and a prostitute too. And that's yeah, pretty much telling you right in the thing what the United States is at this mm -hmm. point. Yeah. Well, hey, fellas, I uh, have a date with my wife tonight, so I had better scoot <laughs> before too much longer. And I'm going to. Fly two guys. I gotta. Okay. Sounds like so, we're gonna yep. wrap up here, Nick. But yeah. So, um, so we are Dave. Scott. If we go to anything, and I will get a hold of Scott. So, well, no, I'm even talking Lansing area. We need to get the professor. We need to hold of the professor. Well, yeah, and so, definitely Scott. Chicago. Thanks so much, Chicago, Scott. Thanks yes. so much for joining Come us. Come to Chicago. Let's hang out. And I would love that. Thank you, gentlemen. Plug so your much. TikTok, it's been a Scott, real pleasure quick. talking to it, you. It's, it's Scott. I've already been. It, it, or initiated as a true Chicagoan, I've done the old style and the uh, ah, very good, whatever it is. I have some in my fridge. Scott, Scott, you know, Scott, Scott look me up on LinkedIn. Scott, look me up on LinkedIn. Absolutely, will yep. do, David. Thank I'll, you. I'll link yeah, look me up on LinkedIn too. I mean, okay. I think you go better with him. I'm a science guy. <laughs> I've lost control. Don't plug liquor? yourself. What's the liquor they always tell you to drink? Hold on, Mike. Chicago. So. Scott, go ahead and plug yourself. We'll edit that little part. Oh, yeah. Uh, hit me up on TikTok at Let's Make Them Pay or uh, my Substack, Let's Make Them Pay dot .com. I would love as many new Substack uh, followers as I could possibly, subscribers as I could possibly get. Thanks a lot, gentlemen. Thank you, Scott, for joining us. Uh, I'll be in touch very soon. Thanks, Scott. Yeah. I say, as in the beginning, if you're still with us, like, subscribe, share, tell your friends, tell your family. Um, Scott, we'd love to have you back on for another episode. I know we didn't get absolutely. I would completely. love to come visit again. Um, I had something because it's beer related before you stop. Yeah, go. I think Gozas are my favorite, my new favorite style of beer. <laughs> so, there we go. Um, um let's say, and uh, yeah, we look forward to another episode. I know we didn't hit as many things as we would have liked to, but we could talk for hours. Yeah, we will definitely get Scott back very soon. Thank you, Professor, for joining us, Mike. I will talk to you soon as well. And thank you, everybody else, Thanks, for, for joining in. You've dialed in to 
box and brews, you might hear something you can use. Like tips on your cash or tips on the suds. You're gonna want to use the smarts of these studs. Because they know the brews, and they know the box, and they know they can't help the stubborn fucks. So listen up, because shit's not funny. And save yourself some beer, beer money. money. Bucks and brews. Bucks and brews. Bucks and brews. Bucks and brews.